the people. In other words, I came to do this the right way. To make you whole for what you would lose in the threshing floor. And Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take up an offer, uh, take an offer up, whatever seems good to him. Look, there are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and yokes of the oxen for wood. The king has done this terrible thing. He turns around, goes to where God tells him to go, finds a man who's in complete subjection to David when he hears that this is for the purposes of God. And he says, I don't want your money. Take the land. I've got oxen on the land I've been using to thresh the grain. Use them for the sacrifice. If you need to build the fire on the altar for the burnt offering, you can destroy all my machinery. You can take it all. You can take all the yoke from the oxen. And you can use that to burn it. In other words, if it's for the purpose of God, take it all. A king who had relied on himself is now confronted by a man who gets it. And it adds insult to the injury. And David is humbled. Now this is the nexus with the two stories. Everything so far has been background. Here's where it comes together. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. He prays a prayer for David. Then the king said to Aruna, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. David understood that giving needed to have some sense of sacrifice connected to it. If you got a hundred thousand dollars in a bank and you tip God with a hundred bucks, it didn't mean anything. Where's the point at which it really means some sacrifice? And David got it. David recognized what we were saying about the tithe. <coughs> you haven't given anything until it really costs you something. Now, when folks get confronted with this, sometimes certain things begin to happen, wheels begin to turn. For some folks, when they are confronted, even with the simple issue of paying tithes, they appoint themselves as the church analyst. What does that mean? It means that they begin to find fault with the pastor, with the message, with the music, with brother and sister so-and-so, with the time of the service, with the color of the carpet, with the songs that somebody chose to sing, and sit back and say, well, you know, I'm not so sure about brother and sister so-and-so. I'm just going to hang on to my money until I'm sure. That's where the enemy of our soul starts because the fallacy in that argument is that this business of what we do or does, do not give is somehow tied to a relationship between the individual and the church or somebody in it. 
This is between an individual and God. You know what it really is? It's the question of who's really running the show in that house. Is it God? Is the reliance on God? Is the heart for God? Or are we the sole gatekeeper of what he puts in our hands? You've heard me say a number of times, you can't kill a dead man. When you finally come to the place where you really realize your life's not your own. And that the worst this world can do to you is to close your eyes and in 27 one hundredths of a second to put you directly standing before the throne of Almighty God. It's the worst the world can do to you. You can't steal from someone who doesn't own anything. When you become a bond servant and everything you own belongs to your master, it doesn't make any difference where it goes. It's not yours. It's only when everything that God has placed in our hands as steward is mistaken for something that belongs to us. When Jesus looked at this woman who walked up to the offering box, And he sees her taking notice, knowing that of all the people who walked up to that box, she had the greatest need. And that she walked up to it saying, I have no faith in an hour's wage. Lord God, if I have you, I don't need this. That impressed him. I've never met a real believer that God has ever left without. I know a lot of people that have had thin times. I know of very few times in our life where we prayed in the next meal being in ministry. But I'll tell you this, they were few and far between and, and, we never miss the next meal. Don't believe it? <laughs> it's never happened. We've had terrible times when we thought things were going to go bad and they had every potential. And God has miraculously moved on us. And though that, though that was true when I was a student, that was true when I made a good wage as a policeman. It was true when we took our first church and I quit my job to do it because the church had gotten large fast. God never left us without. He's faithful. Now, listen to the response of the disciples who are there with him and those who are listening to this. Jesus has just explained how this woman had caught his undivided attention in her sense of her faith toward God and her right understanding of her relationship to her need and to her provision. Fifth verse. Then, as some spoke of the temple, the discussion, as Jesus is looking at the box and the woman, others are looking at the grandeur of the temple. How it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. In the writings of Josephus, in his work entitled 
the wars of the Jews, the fifth book and the fifth chapter. Josephus gives a lengthy description of the majesty of the temple. He describes it as being constructed of great blocks of perfectly hewn stone, that some of which weighed 180 tons plus. Massive, fit together perfectly. He describes the construction of the temple. If you were here during our, our teaching in Leviticus, you know that when they constructed the tabernacle in the wilderness, they were instructed to build panels overlaid with gold in the inside. The temple, this huge edifice, was plated in gold on the inside, and he said that as the light shined through, there was so much gold, Josephus said, it looked like the sun. The temple was filthy, stinking, rich. Now, a little side point. God never instructed anybody to build that temple. Never. Not once did he ask for a temple. Well, that was men's idea. That was somebody with a good idea, not a God idea. God wanted a tent where he was close to the people. And the disciples are looking at this temple, seeing what Josephus described, and looking at it, they're seeing its majesty and how rich it was, seeing all of that. And Jesus is sitting there listening to them and knowing their hearts. He says, you think this is really something? You look at this and you think you see God? Not one single person in that crowd looked past the building and said, there's a veil in that place. And the thing that just sets my soul on fire is that the Shekinah glory of God rests behind that veil. God is in that house. The grandeur of the religious system had become so significant that even his disciples having been with it, they don't see where the real glory is in the building. It's behind a veil and on a mercy seat. And Jesus looks at them and essentially says, listen guys, I'm gonna tell you something. If you think this is what God is, the day is gonna come when there's not gonna be a single stone left on another. They knew the gravity, the weight of the stone that were put together and how fitly formed they were. How impossible it must have seemed that anything that could happen to that virtual ornate fortress So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what will be the what will will there be what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? You can get more sermons on tape, CD, MP3, everything else, spending even entire links, you know, huge series trying to explain each piece of what Jesus is about to say. Matthew says that even after he said this, they go to the, the Mount of Olives for the Olivet Discourse, and they asked him to explain it further in Matthew. I'm here to tell you an interpretation of those exact things that Jesus says wasn't the point. It was not the point of the reason Jesus says it. But Jesus is acting as a, prophetically in this utterance. And he said, take heed that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time has drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. When they say the time is drawn near, you all think that I'm gonna stand up here, throw the Romans out and I'm taking over the government. And I've already told you, that's not what's happening. My goal is to save the human race from the thing that really is dangerous to them. That's an eternity and a lake of fire. 
and I'm going to be killed soon. But there will be those that will come that will steer passions and attempt to get you to stand up and throw the Romans out and proclaim themselves to be the king that God promised. And that's exactly what happened 38 years later. Therefore, do not go after them. The answer is not political. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. When you see things begin to happen, don't get excited. Your confidence, confidence needs to be in God and the fact that he saw it coming and he told you about it. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. So in other words, wars and rumors of wars are going to happen, but they're not the sign. <clears throat> and there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence, and there will be fearful signs and great signs from heaven. I've read books and heard people that have come up with every excuse for that statement about signs in heaven. In the 1990s, I thought this was kind of cool. You know, when I study, I do the inductive thing, and then I go back and check commentaries to see if somebody hit a point that I missed, okay? John Corson had an interesting thing to say. When he taught this in the 1990s, they were making a big deal out of the fact that the National Observatory observed something for the very first time in the heavens. They observed a black hole. And the black hole was 10 billion times the size of our sun. Our sun is 1.2 million times the size of our Earth. So how many times bigger is the black hole than our Earth? A lot. <laughs> now here's the amazing part. They observed this massive black hole approaching an entire galaxy. As a matter of fact, the galaxy was GSA 6241. So if you want to get out your star charts and find out where that galaxy was. But they watched that black hole consume the entire galaxy. Now that's pretty impressive. Was it a sign that the end was, come, was near? No. It was just things that they were becoming aware of. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you. Now listen to this. Before the really miraculous stuff starts to happen, they're going to lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. Can you see this on a recruiting poster for disciples? <laughs> he told the truth. There are those who preach a health and welfare gospel today. I could name names. People that tell you all about how to be happier with your inner self. People who've got their own radio channels on Cirrus. People who have taught that if you just give enough money, if you just give enough, you can force God to give you money back. Now I can tell you in reverencing God, even sacrificially with what you have, whether it be two mites, or whether it be in no known upper limit, there is going to be a reward for that. But to try to cut a business deal with God is a misinterpretation of the scripture. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Do you ever wonder why things are such a mess at work? Have you ever wondered why relationships that you've had that have gone so well have all of a sudden gone sour? How groups you used to belong to and seem comfortable 
Now all of a sudden you're on the outs. Sometimes the reason that God brings trouble to our lives is so that we might be called to account as a venue to testify. To stand up when everybody wants to hear something else and to say what Roman soldiers said when they were greeted, saying Caesar is Lord. And in that one instant, for them to give the salute and say, no sir, Jesus is Lord. That's why the trouble. It's the time to stand up and in meekness of spirit speak. There were 10 periods of persecution that are recorded in history in the Roman Empire, two of which were very general all over the empire, many that were regional. The scripture tells us that when Paul was finally taken and insisted on being taken to Rome, prior to that time, Nero, Caesar Nero, actually wasn't all that bad a guy. I mean, the guy was weird. The guy engaged in homosexuality, even with children at times. The guy came from a family that were murderers and thieves. But he had not done the major things that we credit to him. History tells us that Paul got a shot at standing before Nero. I don't know exactly what he said, but we know what happened immediately thereafter. Immediately thereafter, Nero rejected the testimony of Paul and began to go berserk. That's when Nero, knowing what would had been said of Christians, that they were to be the light of the world, he was informed. Had Christians dipped in wax and burned on pedestals as light as he drove a chariot wildly through the streets without a stitch of clothes on. Insane knowing that we were called the sheep and Jesus was called the good shepherd, wrapped people in fresh sheep skins and set them in arenas to be attacked by wolves. He went absolutely insane, burned a section of the city, blaming Christians because he wanted an architecturally better building. Many people have said, and I believe it may be true, that when he decided to reject Jesus, that at that moment, the man became possessed. Throwing away the sincere invitation of the heart to invite Jesus as Lord and Savior is a dangerous thing. Fourteenth verse, therefore settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. When you get the divine appointment, you step up. God will fill your mouth. He'll tell you exactly what to say. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends and wives. And you will put some of you, to, and he will put some of you to death. And you will be hated for all, you will be hated by all, all kinds of people for my name's sake but not a hair of your head shall be lost. Now that sounds like it's a contradiction. You just said, some of us are gonna die for you, that they're gonna do terrible things, and now you say not a hair in your head's gonna be lost? It was an idiom, it was a saying. We have idioms in our own culture. Something happens to somebody and you say, well, it's no skin off my nose. That's, that is an American idiom. 
This was a Hebrew idiom. And what it meant was nothing that really amounts to anything is going to be lost. God is going to preserve you in a reality that's going to be so much more than anything you think you've lost here. You'll brush it off like it was nothing. Didn't matter. By your patience, possess your souls. There is a series of sermons just in that statement. By sitting down, calming down, not getting excited, focusing on the things of God. By patiently seeking God in prayer when everything in you screams, get up and take some action. By seeking him in his word, and taking his counsel is opposed to developing the best possible good idea. Don't do it. Possess your soul in patience. Wait till you got the mind of God. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that this is that it's desolate that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee feet of the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let those who are in the country enter her, uh, enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all bring which are written may be fulfilled. 38 years later, there is a move at profound rebellion those that claim to be coming to set Israel nationalistic back on their foundation as the preeminent power. These are those who relied on politics. Rome responded by sending a commander and three legions. They dug a trench around the entire city of Jerusalem, posted them and set siege for 142 days. Josephus says that the famine inside Jerusalem was so severe that people were eating young children. Yeah, Jews. They were starving to death. And eventually they were destroyed. When the Romans finally attacked, the final death toll was 1.2 million. Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed, not one stone sitting on another. Everybody knew about the riches of the temple. They knew about the <clears throat> ceremonial religion. They knew about the gold. The Roman general commanding at the siege, when the final assault was to take place, gave instructions to the legions that no one should bother the temple. Do not do damage to that temple. Rome wanted it. When they made the attack, a drunken Roman soldier threw a torch into the temple where thousands of Jews had congregated to take refuge. And the fire burned so intensely that it incinerated all of them. It burned so hot that it melted all of the gold on the walls as described for the tabernacle. They duplicated it in the temple. And it melted and it was so hot and became so liquid that it went between the cracks and the stones, those 180 ton stones right to the foundations. Roman soldiers, knowing that there was gold buried there, used every mean at their disposal to completely and totally dismantle the temple to get at the gold right to its foundations without one stone remaining on another to capture the gold. Everything Jesus said was true. He proved himself to be an accurate 
an accurate prophet. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in these, those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Rome would turn its entire wrath against Jerusalem, killing as if it were genocide. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into, unto all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentile until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Gentiles have been in control of Jerusalem continually from the fall in 70 AD until 1967 when Israel took control of Jerusalem. It was the first time the Jews controlled it. Many believe that the end of the time of the Gentiles was in 1967 and that we've been living in overtime since then. That the rapture of the church could happen at any time. If that's the case, many of us were not believers until after 1967. Aren't you glad he waited for us? It was grace, mercy. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations. It's really interesting to read that phrase in the Greek. Distress of nations means there will be problems at the time of the end that nobody knows how to fix. It's not possible. Now for me, because I follow financial markets so clearly, a lot, I can see where this is. Did you know it's mathematically impossible, impossible to pay back the debt our nation has? There is not enough money. Our debt is coming to the point where the annual increase in debt is more than the entire gross national product of the United States. It's not possible. There are no answers. We wonder why our government does the things it does now. Well, there's an answer to that. Men's heart failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. Now he gives them instruction. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Do you understand that there's nothing that we possess or that we own that means anything? Peter tells us that God at the end of time is going to let go of all matter. Everything that is, our corporal bodies, the clothes we wear, the car we drive, the dirt we walk on, everything would fly apart if it was not for the Spirit of God holding it together. And Peter says that the day will come when everything that is material will fly apart. God is going to let it go. And the only thing that's going to be left is what he holds in his hand, that's you and I. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, 